meat doesn't really ferment like fiber does. It doesn't really ferment like carbohydrates do. It doesn't ferment like other foods. So is meat totally whacking out your gut biome? Well, let's take a look. I want to look at this in the most unbiased way possible. And the first thing that I want to lead off with are two studies that look at red meat consumption, but in different regions of the world and how they potentially have a different effect. First study published in American Journal of Clinical Nutrition took a look at Asians, okay? And they, they found that Asians that eat meat, there was a correlation between red meat consumption and actually less cardiovascular disease or mortality. Well, that's kind of wild, because then when you look at current atherosclerosis reports and you look at that in Americans, you find that more processed red meat ended up resulting in an increased mortality from cardiovascular disease as well as diabetes. Well, that's kind of interesting. I guess at first glance, I wanted to set the tone. We have to look at some context here. Okay, like you look at various cultures, like the Asian culture might eat red meat sparingly and they're going to consume it in a little bit more of a wholesome fashion possibly, like with a normal meal. Whereas when Americans are typically eating red meat, I mean, generally speaking, not people that are maybe conscious about it and doing a clean keto or something like that, but people that are con you know, not being conscious about it, they're gonna eat a burger with fries and a shake and things like that, right? Well, of course, that's going to <laughs> contribute to a lot of inflammatory responses within the body. But I'm gonna get off my high horse in terms of overall metabolic holistic look and get down to the nitty gritty of the microbiome for a second. After today's video, I put a link down below for Thrive Market. That is a 30% off discount link plus a free gift. So 30% off your entire grocery order. The thing I like about Thrive Market is they're trying to help get gnarly processed foods out of people's fridge and out of people's pantries. So these are healthier for you options, better for you options, and the prices are highly, highly competitive. So a lot of times you're going to find prices cheaper than the grocery store and it's delivered directly to your doorstep. So when it comes to like recalibrating your pantry, Thrive Market really, really is solid. It's very helpful to be able to have all your grocery shopping at your fingertips so you're not stressed about finding the right things. You can search. You can do a quick search for gluten-free. You can do a search for paleo. You can do a search for sugar-free, for keto, for this, for that, all at your fingertips, and then it's delivered directly to your doorstep. But let's be real, we're all pinching some pennies, so the best thing about it is that 30% off discount link off your entire grocery order using that link down below. I use my Thrive Box consistently. I'm always changing up stuff. I'm always getting a Thrive order coming in a couple times per month and it helps save me a bunch of money, but it also gets me some really cool stuff that I otherwise wouldn't find at the grocery store. So check them out in the top line of the description underneath this video. The first thing is something called NEU 5GC that I want to look at. Okay, we'll just call it new 5GC. This new 5GC is something that a lot of the, I'm just going to call it the radical plant-based community because I'm not opposed to plant-based, but some of the community gets pretty aggressive sometimes. New 5GC is something that is used as ammunition saying like meat is bad all around. Well, if we understand it, we can kind of look at both sides. So new 5GC is produced by mammals, mammals that we generally eat like pork and like cows and things like that. Okay. Well, humans used to produce new 5GC up until like two, three million years ago. And then they found that, okay, well somehow through some kind of mutation, we stopped producing new 5GC. So what ends up happening is because new 5GC is now considered foreign to humans because we don't produce it anymore, there's a little bit of a weird response when we consume it in mammals. The body does react a little strange to it. It does say, hey, wait a minute, what is this? And it treats it as such, especially in like Petri dish studies when you look at the actual reaction. We don't really know how to deal with it, but our gut does know how to deal with it. And that's what we have to look at. But just because we don't deal with it, like chemically, doesn't mean that our microbiome can't deal with it. Here's what's interesting. Okay, there's something called the hormetic curve and we need some degree, a little bit of stress now and then for the body to adapt, right? It's no different than you hopping in an ice bath to get an adaptation or going in the sauna to get an adaptation to heat or heck, even a tiny bit of alcohol to get an adaptation. It's perfectly normal. Now I'm not saying we bombard our body with new 5GC, but when you look at the evidence in the microbiome, it's pretty fascinating. There's a study that was published in Nature Microbiology, took a look at mice for four weeks, and it fed them a diet very high in new 5GC. Okay, what was interesting is that they had an increase in bacteroids and also an increase in Clostridialis. Now, these bacteria are associated with an abundance of enzymes that can cleave off the new 5GC. What does that mean? Okay. So new 5GC by itself isn't really an issue because it just comes in our body and gets excreted. So let's say you eat a steak and it has 
it's low quality steak with a bunch of new 5GC. Okay, if it's clean, your body, your body can deal with it and process it. Okay, but if it's bound to different molecules because pH is different, whatever, that's when it becomes a problem because that's when it can get absorbed. And then our body does legitimately have to deal with it and it triggers a potential immune response. It's, it's viable. Okay, but when you look at like Clostridium dialis and you look at kind of the abundance of these bacteria, that's associated with enzymes that can break and cleave off the new 5GC so that you just excrete it. It never goes past our hermetically sealed contained biome. Like it's perfectly fine there. And they took a look at other things like cross-referencing enzymes, like removing enzymes, adding enzymes to see, yes, this actually was the case. This environment that was created by exposure to a little bit of the new 5GC actually allowed it to have the capability to deal with the new 5GC. So if we're not ever exposing ourselves then we don't develop the ability to deal with it. But one of the big things we have to look at is, once again, a healthy microbiome to deal with this. So is it a which came first, the chicken or the egg kind of thing? Like if you have a very unhealthy individual that's just drinking milkshakes all day long and eating double quarter pounders all the time, well, their microbiome is going to be out of whack and unable to adapt because they're not going to have that sort of hinge like they, they can't move, they can't flexicute, right? I call it flexicution, where they just, they can bend and mold and move and be able to grow in certain ways. Point is, is that that plays a big role. Diversity does matter. Okay, that's why like getting good amounts of fiber in along with your meat is very important. And I've got more to talk about here. I'm just giving you some suggestions. Okay, still really focusing mainly on doing the most with the least. Okay, you don't have to bombard yourself with protein. You can only absorb so much at one point in time. Okay, try to add fiber and veggies along with it so that you're supporting the microbiome so it can make the decisions that it needs to make. And now we have to talk about the big ugly elephant in the room, TMAO. Okay, TMAO is really talked about a lot as far as its correlation with all kinds of different inflammatory issues and cardiovascular disease. Okay, what it is, when you consume red meat, you have something called L-carnitine. L-carnitine gets converted into trimethylamine, TMA. TMA, further on down the line, gets converted into something called TMAO. TMAO can cause some issues. Okay? It can stimulate an inflammatory response. We don't really want that. But what's interesting is TMA production, actually producing TMA in the first place when we consume meat, is associated with gut dysbiosis, meaning that if your gut's out of whack, you're going to probably make more TMA. It's also associated with something called gamma proteobacteria. And what's really interesting about gamma proteobacteria is that is associated with low fiber intake in other situations. Hmm. Okay. So if someone doesn't eat a lot of fiber, they have a high amount of gamma proteobacteria. Okay. High amount of gamma proteobacteria makes it so that you have more TMA derived from meat that you eat. I'm starting to see another correlation here, right? Maybe the issue is the gut biome in the first place of relatively unhealthy people that are eating a lot of meat. But when you look at healthy people that eat a decent amount of meat, there's not as much of an issue. So which came first? Is it the meat causing the problem or is it really setting the pace with our lifestyle and maybe just overdoing just about everything? But then we get into fermentation, which is really fascinating because we start talking about pH. Now this is kind of complex, but we're gonna simplify it. Okay, when you consume meat, there is a level of fermentation that occurs and sometimes if meat sits in your gut long enough, it ferments into hydrogen sulfide, which is not good. We don't want that in our body either. There's no denying that. I'm not denying what a lot of the plant-based crowd will say. Like, that's not good, but there's ways that we deal with it. You see, there's these things called proteases, and these proteases break down the protein to a certain degree. Sometimes we want the protein broken down just enough so we can deaminate it and actually use it for muscle, but we also don't want it broken down in certain ways that are going to release hydrogen sulfide. Well, that comes down to a pH thing. What's really interesting is that a wider variety of gut bacteria is going to create more short-chain fatty acids, which, guess what? Drop the pH of your gut. They drop the pH of your colon. They make it so that, guess what? Those proteases make it so that you don't break it down the same. You don't break down the L-carnitine into the TMA so that it can convert into TMAO. You see, it's a big picture here that we have to look at. And one last final thought, and then I'll let you go. Okay, the hemi-iron piece. There is a lot of evidence out there that shows that if you consume too much iron coming in from like red meat, that it can affect and it can actually chelate in your gut. There is some truth to that, like excess iron consumption. But then why are we still dealing with such an anemic issue, right? An issue with people being anemic. Well, a lot of times it comes down to a balance of needing magnesium to actually allow this whole process to occur. 
Usually, it's not a deficiency in iron that people are seeing. You actually are getting enough iron. It's usually a magnesium issue. So does iron chelate in the gut? Well, it can, but that's not really what we're after here. We're not talking about that per se. There's a balance once again. If you're consuming nothing but red meat and you're not getting a balance with these other minerals, then yes, you could run into an issue. So fiber first, then focus on the meat. And I think you'll notice that, wait a minute, now I have the gut biome to actually do something with the meat. Unless you are on like a specific carnivore style protocol where that is exactly what you are doing for an anti-inflammatory purpose, it would be foolish to not add fiber and support your gut microbiome so you can get the most out of the meat that you eat. But I don't think it's necessarily right to only blame meat. So yeah, we should always be giving a nod to the research that is coming out either direction, whether it's plant-based, omnivore, like whatever, okay? Because we can learn a lot from it and we can understand how the body is working. That's the point. So as always, keep it locked in here on my channel. I'll see you tomorrow.